Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. Please also consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to our next topic. I'm sitting here eating a steak, so. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine, Dr. Baker. I was just telling, I was just telling Zach that this is really weird to me because I've listened to probably at least 15 of your podcasts on here. Yeah, cool. You know, and I'm used to hearing you guys talk with other guests. And this is really weird and strange for me actually speaking with you directly. Well, that's cool. Let's let's get it going, Zach. Why don't you start recording this? Uh, can I ask you a question first, Dr. Sure. Baker? Sure, sure. Uh, I uh, printed out the post that I wrote on part of my story, Broken Man, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be reading, you know, pieces off of that. If that's okay with you. And you guys can just cut me off and question me, you know. If, sure. If that's how you want to handle it. Yeah, I mean, we can we can do whatever. I mean, I think we'll just start out in, kind of introducing you and then kind of get a little bit in your story. You, you know, you can go where we can take where we want to. I mean, it's interesting. Oh. Well, I, we'll, we'll we'll get this stuff in the co podcast because there's some interesting stuff that 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 I think we can get into. So okay. So we we just kind of spontaneous, you know. Zach okay. and I just kind of I think that's more since it, it turns out better that way. I think. Okay. Yeah, you got a great story, Jeff. So I think. Uh, I think that'll work fine, and we'll we'll ask you some questions, and I think it'll sure. it'll uh, flow nicely. But um, sure. yeah, well, th thanks for taking time to come on the podcast. Uh, you know, we've had uh, quite a few interesting guests, I think, and I think you're you're just going to add to that. So, um, if you want to start us off by just kind of sharing a little bit about you, about yourself, about your background and stuff, we can kind of build off from there. Sure. Okay. My name is Jeff Sear. Uh, I'm 58 years old. Uh, I've been through some, you know, different things in, during my life. Uh, I, I no longer work anymore. I'm to I've been totally disabled uh, since January of 2004 after my last back surgery. Uh, I was diagnosed with diabetes also back in 2005. Uh, I've been on, I've been on a low carbohydrate diet. I actually started it in uh, November of 2012. November 1st of 2012 is when I first started a low carb ketogenic style diet. I'm still following that today. Uh, it's going to be six years on. You know, it's going to be six years pretty soon here for me. Uh, so I'm not sure where you want to take it from there. Jeff, you know, it's kind of interesting, um, you know, and I apologize, guys. I'm in the middle of the beating of a steak, so if you hear me chomping on stuff, I've got about two and a half pounds of ribeye in front of me that i got to get through. It's <laughs> <laughs> the, way, the way the day worked out. I just couldn't get the meal in when I wanted to, so I'm going to have to do it now. But, you know, I kind of read a little bit of your, your story, Jeff. It's kind of interesting. You know, you had – so, you know, 2005, you, you, you get diagnosed with type, type 2 diabetes – what was a uh, you know obviously you were involved in you know obviously you had a doctor that was managing that and how did how was it managed initially and what were you told and what kind of advice did you get and what was this what was the treatment strategy you know from 2005 until you decided to go low carb in 2012 what made you decide to change your diet okay uh before i was diagnosed in uh, in 2005 i had to go for for uh uh, pre-surgery blood work because I had I, I, I had gotten a, a lower hernia uh, because of my disabilities from my three surgeries and I weighed 330 pounds uh, I could uh, I was locked inside of a lazy boy chair basically what I mean by that uh, I had to sleep in my chair because of my surgeries, I'm still this way today. I can't lay on the floor or lay in a bed to sleep. So, 
in in early '05, uh, I I had to use the cane with all of my force to try and lift myself from my lazy boy chair from a sitting position to a standing position. And I had to use a walker to walk from my lazy boy chair to the kitchen to get a glass of water. I could only walk very, very slow. So I ended up getting a hernia from that. So I went for, for, for blood labs before my hernia surgery. And the doctor that was doing the surgery for the hernia called me at home and he told me, Jeff, we can't, we, we can't do the surgery now. We have to postpone it. Uh, we have your blood work and you have to go see a doctor. Uh, you're a severe type 2 diabetic. So they hooked me up with a doctor and I went in to see the doctor. And I had a fasting blood sugar of 300. I had a hemoglobin A1C of 12.0, which is an average blood sugar of 350. And really, the only thing that this endocrinologist told me, and I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing, he basically told me, Mr. Sear, welcome to the club. Uh, type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. I'm going to write you two prescriptions, one for metformin and one for Avandia for now. But this is a progressive disease, and down the road, you're going to have most probably going to have to go to injected insulin. And then he, he hooked me up with an American Diabetes Association dietitian at our local hospital. I had to go there for nutritional advice on how to eat for my type 2 diabetes. I went to the ADA nutritionist, and she fed me the typical ADA guidelines for type 2 diabetes. You have to watch out for low, low blood sugars. Here I am, a diabetic that has average blood sugars of 350, fasting sugars of 300, and I'm told that I have to watch out for low blood sugars. So I have to eat at least three meals a day of between 45 to 70 grams of carbohydrate. Now, this is carbohydrate from starchy carbs, complex carbohydrate whole grains, a lot of fruits, oatmeal, cereals. Uh, eat at least three meals a day, and they also want you to have two snacks in between. So uh, keep in mind that this time I knew nothing about diabetes or carbohydrates or whatever. So I followed this typical advice, and I was on Avandia and Metformin, and I kept on this trail. Uh, at, at the time, I wasn't able to exercise. Like I said, I was very physically handicapped. Just to go quickly through this now, I was handicapped because I had three major surgeries from a period from October of 1997 to, the to January of 2004. October of 97, I had to have what's called an what's called an, an, an emergency laminectomy infusion of the lumbar region. I had severe pressure on L3, L4, L5, and L6. And the, uh, the reason why the, uh, there was so much pressure on the spinal column that I was told that I was about to sever all of the nerves from the waist down and I was going to end up in a wheelchair. So they had to do an emergency surgery at, on me at 7.30 the following morning. I ended up staying eight days in the hospital after the surgery. The doctor was worried that I might not be able to urinate on my own, uh, my own capacity after the surgery. I might not be able to walk. Eventually, I was able to urinate, but I have to urinate sitting down. I can't urinate standing up. I'm still that way today. That was my first surgery. I was, I was only 37 years old at that time. Uh, eventually, I went back to work. Then in May of 2001, I had another, I had an injury at work. And I had to have what's called a cervical neck fusion. I ruptured C4, C5, and C6 in the neck area. So they had to do a cervical neck fusion. They put pieces of bone marrow in place of the ruptured disc. 
the Port Clicker Square titanium plate and they fuse you up. So that was my cervical neck fusion. I had to work for four months. Went back to work. Then a couple of years later, in January of 2000, well, I got hurt in October of 2003. In, Jan in January of 2004, uh, that's, this is my last surgery now. They had to do what's called a laminectomy infusion on my mid-back on the T11 and T12 area. After this third surgery, then they put me permanently and totally disabled for the rest of my life. I had just turned, I had just turned 44 years old. That's a brief history of my surgeries. That's how I became totally disabled. Uh, so getting back to my diabetes, uh, I was at, at that point, I weighed 330 pounds. Uh, I couldn't exercise. I had to walk with a walker inside my house. Uh, I became addicted to oral morphine uh, from, the, from the severe pain, uh, high doses of oral morphine. I had a lot of pain, obviously, from all these surgeries. I had titanium rods titanium screws, titanium plates, all the way from my, almost from my tailbone up to my neck area. So yeah, I was in a lot of, you know, severe pain. I still am today, but anyway, uh, so I'm not sure if you want to ask me any questions about the surgeries or anything before I keep on going. Well, no, I mean, Jim, I'm, I'm talking you know, kind of I'm, fast here. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, as a practicing physician, your story is not unusual, you know, as far as, you know, we see a lot of people that, I mean, and, and quality of life is awful. I mean, we see this horrible, uh, you know, destruction of joints, you know, I mean, you know, we think about, you know, your neck, you know, you had neck arthritis at a young age. I mean, I assume you weren't doing headstands and walking on your head. There wasn't any kind of major trauma no. to your neck. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, we talk about arthritis being a mechanical phenomenon. It's not like when people gain weight, their head so suddenly gets really big and heavy. I mean, it's not like your head gets bigger. And so it's, a you know, arthritis is a metabolic disease in many cases. I think it's an orthopedic manifestation of metabolic disease. And we see that with people with finger, you know, finger arthritis. And all these things are non-load-bearing -load joints. And so clearly, you know, we've been missing the ball with, with our thoughts that it's all mechanical. Now, you didn't get to 330 pounds, you know, just naturally. I mean, you, you know, well, I, I, I would imagine you had a pretty poor diet. Uh, leading oh. up to this, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, just a quick backup for one second. I was always very obese my whole life from a young age. But just quickly here, at the age of 17, I'm 6'2 in height. At the age of 17, I, I used to work, work, work as a lumberjack in the woods. My father was a wood contractor. And back then, we used to cut the wood, uh, cut down the trees with a chainsaw cut the limbs off the trees, cut the, the, uh, cut the pieces of wood into four foot sections and pile it by hand with a pulp hook. So I used to load four foot pulp wood by hand from a young age. So I was 17 years old and I weighed 345 pounds. Now, I was very obese, but I had a lot of muscle back then at 17 because of the work that I was doing. But yes, you're correct. I always ate a very poor diet, very high refined carbohydrate, vegetable oils, food, you know, my mother used to fry everything with fruit. back then, I was born in 1960, so you would fry foods in Crisco oil, vegetable oil. You know, when I was a young kid, I mean, I drink so sort of let's say so now you get to yeah, I mean, I, that's not surprising. I mean, that, that's pretty typical. I think we all, anybody, to, no matter what your dietary belief, we, I think most of us agree drinking Coca-Cola and eating refined, processed, garbage carbohydrates and, and you know, and, and arguably vegetable oils is awful for us, or some people will debate that. But I think most people would understand that. And so yes. the fact that you ended up in your position, you know, particularly with a diet like that is not that unusual unfortunately it's becoming more and more common now you get to 2005 you see the registered dietitian and they say you know go eat you know eat healthy carbohydrates which i, I would say that was a what most people's perception would be whole grains you know starchy carbs uh you know i'm sure she wasn't telling you to eat cookies and cakes and and and, and, and twinkies but i mean so did, were you able to do that i mean did you were you were, did you did you did you listen to the dietitian and take her advice and and, and really 
do what they said? Well, at that time, I more or less followed what this dietitian told me as best I could. What does that mean when you say more or less? Does that mean you're ninety percent of the time, or what was? What, I mean, I mean, because well, I, I think it's a fair question. We we need to because yeah, I was following the you know the basic guidelines. I was eating three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I had two snacks in between, and it was a high carbohydrate diet. Probably I don't know. I'm going to say between oh at least two hundred and fifty grams of carbohydrate per day mostly from starchy carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, low, you know, low in protein compared to what I eat today. Uh, no saturated fat. Red meat was frowned upon because of the saturated fat, you know. So I followed that and I kept on taking metformin. I was maxed out at like 2,000 milligrams a day. Avandia. My A1Cs were still very high. Like I said, I wasn't able to exercise at that time. My A1Cs, I was trying to think this morning back then, you know, I think they were still in the area of like 9%, 10% A1Cs. You know, it was still very high blood sugars, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, kind, of, it's, it's kind of interesting that even today, I think that the, some of the diets, the diabetic goals are still, you know, 7%. They don't even want a normal, you know, they're not even shooting for a normal blood glucose. So, you know, now you, you go back, and this goes on for several years. I'm sure you're continuing to see your endocrinologist, your primary care physician, or whoever that's managing your diabetes, and the, and the dietitian. What do they say about this 9% business? Are they, do they tell you to do anything different, or what's the advice at this point? To be honest with you, they're just, you know, I'm being totally honest. Some people say I'm crazy, but they didn't really seem to be that concerned about an A1C of 9 of 9% or 10%. Uh, and I was very obese. It's true that I was in a bad shape physically, but again, at 330 pounds, I was very, very obese. I had a lot of body fat. And, you know, and, you know, I'm not blaming anybody for my diabetes. I'm the one that ate the way that I ate. I'm the one that made myself 330 pounds. Uh, I didn't really start looking into this stuff at that time. I had other, you know, I was, I had a lot going on with, you know, with, from the pain from my surgeries and stuff. And I was dealing, I fell into a big depression because I was no longer able to work anymore. And uh, I, I had worked hard physically my whole life. Uh, I was trained in the school. I, I was a metal fabricator, a metal machinist, a metal welder. I used to read blueprints to build things. And, you know, I always worked my whole life, seven days a week. Jeff equaled work. No one could outwork me. So when this happened to me, after all these surgeries and all this stuff, I became depressed because I couldn't work anymore. Yeah, I mean that's completely under, that's understandable why you why why you'd be depressed, and I think that you know the situation is, is is depressing, obviously. And then I think there's also there's a, a physiological thing that's going on, probably the same thing that's contributing to some of these other disease processes, is probably leading to, to depression. But so let me let me just fast forward a little bit, Jeff, because you you know the interesting thing is you know you were diagnosed with what I believe was primary sclerosis and cholangitis, yeah, uh, which is a you know a, a relatively rare liver disease is considered to be autoimmune i believe that affects people and generally the outcome is pretty poor many people die from that in fact you know you yes. pointed out that, that walter payton you know walter payton when i grew up i lived in chicago when i was a kid and he was one of my heroes you know i don't have a lot yeah. of athletic heroes at this age because I'm, I'm too damn old to worry about this but when i was a kid i was i was i really thought walter payton was a great guy great athlete great work ethic just a wonderful person uh, you know i i still think he's one of the greatest running backs there ever there ever was but yes. you know, he died from this uh, and it was, a, it was, a, it was just shocking. And it makes me sad that, you know, he, he, he was taken from us from, from, at that age, at, at, I think 45, my uncle, you know, I had an uncle that died from the same disease. You know, this was about five years ago. Same thing. I mean, he's a relatively health conscious guy, uh, you know, but he got, he got it and died, you know, fairly soon after his diagnosis. So, so let's talk about that now. Cause that, that has affected you. Okay. I was lucky. Uh, I was lucky because, well, first of all, uh, I was caught early. Uh, I had very elevated liver enzymes, GGT, ALT, AST. Total bilirubin was high. So 
my primary care doctor caught that during routine blood work. She sent me to a gastroenterologist. Uh, the gastroenterologist, the liver doctor had to do a series of tests to find out, you know, to try and get to the bottom of it. Because like you said, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, it's an autoimmune disease. It's fairly rare. So they start off with, a, you know, they do another complete blood panel of their own. Then they do a, they do an, uh, they do an ultrasound of the liver. Then they do a CAT scan of the liver. Then they do an MRI of the bile ducts and an MRI of the liver. And then the final one after this is a liver biopsy. After all of these things are done, only then can they confirm a diagnosis. So, I, you know, this took a series of months for all these tests, to have all these tests done. So my doctor called me at home and told me that she had to see me the next day. I went over and she told me, uh, you have primary sclerosis and cholangitis. She started explaining it to me. So I asked her, you know, if there's any cure for the disease. She said the only known cure is a liver transplant, but you only get a liver transplant once you're at the very end, you're, you're at de uh, death's door almost. Uh, we caught you early. You don't, you don't uh, she, she was telling me that you don't have any scarring of liver tissue. There's no cirrhosis of the liver. You have very elevated liver enzymes, very high bil uh, total bilirubin, but we caught you very early in the, in the, in, in the process. Normally, this is diagnosed in middle-aged men, uh, white men, for some reason. Uh, I asked her if there, you know, is there any medic, you know, what can I do? What, what can be done? You know, there, she says, there's nothing that can be done. All we can do is every six months bring you in for blood work, and you have to get a, a you also have to go for MRI of the bile ducts of the liver because the bile ducts get large and inflamed and impedes the bile flow in the liver. So uh, at this point, this hit me kind of hard because prior to that diagnosis of my liver disease, I had just gone through a whole process where uh, I, I, I already explained how I was physically and I was diabetic and I was very heavy and such. Well, I, I told you I was addicted, addicted to oral morphine. Uh, I used to smoke. At that point, I was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, so I was in bad shape, and I wanted to do something about it, you know? One day, I went to the grocery store with my wife when I was 330 pounds prior to my liver diagnosis, and I had a, I had a very hard time walking. I had to use a cane or a walker in those... Uh, carts for handicaps in the grocery store. But I, I got out of my vehicle in the parking lot of the grocery store and I saw this older man get out of his car across from me. And he was walking, pulling an oxygen tank, you know, and he, had, he was hooked up to oxygen and he was pulling the oxygen tank behind him. This is in the summer of 2008, summer of 08. So that was, my, I'll say, it's just like I've heard Zach say, that was my come to Jesus moment. I've heard Zach, uh, Zach say this in a podcast, my come to Jesus moment. I saw that man and I thought to myself, here I am. Yes, I'm in bad shape, but there's people that are way worse off than I am. And I'm thinking to myself, if I keep on the way that I'm going, smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, addicted to this oral morphine, not doing any exercise, not doing anything. If I keep this up, I'm not gonna be around for very long. And my wife used to tell me when I'd go to bed at night and I'd sleep in my chair, she'd hear me all night long because uh, oral morphine is very hard on the respiratory system. And I was a heavy smoker and she would hear me breathing through the night. And she told me after that she was afraid she'd get up in the morning and she'd find me dead. So anyway, I saw this man and I thought to myself, this has to change here. So finally, 
October 1st of, you know, I had to take these things one at a time. I had a lot of shit going on here. October 1st, 2008, I quit, I quit smoking cigarettes cold turkey. So got that out of the way. Then the beginning of January in 2009, I quit the oral morphine cold turkey without telling my pain management doctor. And it's, you hear stories about people that, that take heroin, how the withdrawal symptoms that they go through. I went through similar things. It lasted for three or four weeks. I got through that. Then I thought to myself, I've got to try and learn about diabetes and try to learn how to eat differently. I went and I found the book, Reversing Diabetes. It was written by this ADA doctor, and it was more like, it was a diet similar to what I was following, but uh, maybe less, you know, carbohydrate. So anyway, in April of 2009, I went to my local gym. I started riding a recumbent bike. First day, I think I rode, rode the bike for one or two minutes. I started keeping a diary of my time at the gym. The first day was like two minutes at a certain intensity. I bought a polar heart rate monitor and I started monitoring my heart rate. And anyway, I went on and I read that book, Reversing Diabetes, and uh, I started exercising and started building up on the exercise and got into HIIT training on the bike two or three times a week and on and on. And over the course of about 15 months, probably I lost about 163 pounds. I went down to 170 pounds, but I was just I lost a lot of my lean tissue. I lost a lot of bone mass. People that knew me thought I had cancer. That's how, I mean, I was very frail. I didn't have much lean mass and I was just like a bag of bones. Jeff, let me just interrupt you here because I'm trying to get the sequence here. So you, you 2009, you know, you've been, you've been a diabetic for four years, hanging out at 3.30, smoking a bunch, you know, just feeling awful. You, you, you go on this crap, you know, change your diet, you know, you, you, know, you reduce your a little bit less carbohydrate, but still eating quite a bit of carbohydrate. You do lots of exercise. You lose 170 pounds or whatever it was, 160 yeah. pounds. Yeah. And you had not yet been diagnosed with the primary sclerosis and cholangitis yet, correct? Is that correct? That's correct. So yeah. now, so now you said you're, 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 you felt like you lost a lot of muscle. You're, you're just, you're just too, too emaciated is what you're feeling. So well, now what? So now what's happening? What I mean, what happened well, with your diabetes? Well, tell me what happened to your diabetes when you lost all that weight. Did you really okay, lost. I, I lost all that weight, and I was still on metformin and Avandia. And I was riding the bike uh, at least like 32 miles every day at a certain intensity. I just couldn't stop myself, and I would do hit two or three times a week. Uh, anyway, uh, I lost all that weight, and my, I went for my A1C at my, my, my primary care, and I had an A1C of 6.0. That's with the all this exercise, losing all the weight, and this diabetes medication, 6.0. And my d doctor at that time, a primary care, she came out and she told me, Jeff, you no longer have type 2 diabetes. Well, I was naive at that point. I, I didn't know what I know today, and I, I believed her. Wow, I no longer have diabetes. So anyway... This is, uh, well, I started in 15 months. This is almost like the spring of 2011 by then. Now. You know, and I was diagnosed with that liver disease in November of 2011. Right. When, I was diagnosed, when I was diagnosed in November of 2011, I weighed like 170. Uh, I was told I was no longer type 2 diabetic. I didn't even see it about 6.0. So. I mean, I mean, certainly, I mean, I think that, that is a powerful statement for exercise. You know, and a lot of people will, will uh, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of exercise and I, and I, and, and so is and Zach, obviously we both are. And so I think, you know, we, we, we talk about low carb diets and zero carb diets and carnivore diets and other stuff, but I, I do think it's important to, to recognize that by exercise, you're able to lose, you know, 170 pounds and, and bring your A1C into a you know relatively normal range. So I think that's an important thing we shouldn't overlook and just discount. But but go yes. on and, and continue with your story. Let me yeah, let okay. me jump in real quick, Jeff. Sorry, sure. sorry guys, but sure. uh, I did want to highlight one thing or ask you one thing. 
about yeah. that process too, because I think, I mean, when, when we look at kind of where you are at 330 pounds, you know, you've had these, these issues that anyone by themselves would be considered a pretty big task to handle for, for a person. And, and you mentioned like you got to that point where you realized, okay, I'm smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. You know, things are, things are essentially at rock bottom for me. Um, and then you decide to do something about that. And, you know, when I talk to people, what, whether it's just for, you know, general, like, uh, let's get some exercise into the routine, um, you know, versus trying to optimize something that they've already been doing. It, I usually try to frame it like, okay, we got to start with where you're at. Um, and, you know, for some people that is, let's see if I can get around the block one time. And, uh, I think that's really difficult for people to do sometimes because there's no shortage of pictures of people and information on the internet of people, you know, doing all these spectacular things. And then you can be very easy to kind of get into a, like a paralysis by analysis and not really be able to start that journey that has to start with something very small. So what did you do from even just a mental standpoint to kind of say, okay, I got to do something to change because obviously you kind of had probably an idea of where you'd maybe want to be someday, which is uh, in your case, probably quite a way down the road. What did you do originally to kind of get that started? Did you say like, I'm going to just hop on an exercise bike, the recumbent bike for like say 10 minutes and then build from there? Or it sounds like you got up to a fairly decent amount of exercise pretty quick. Yeah. Well, it, it, it took me a, it took me a, you know, a couple of months there. Uh, I started researching, you know, like on heart rates and you know, different stuff. I started looking at basal, beta, basal metabolic rates and stuff like that. And, and, I, and I, I knew that there was something that I'd be able to do physically. Like I, I'm not able to freestand. What I mean by that, even today, if I'm talking with you in my kitchen right now, face to face, standing up, I have to hold on to the countertop. I'm not able to freestand on my own. I, I'm only able to freestand for maybe like 30 or 45 seconds and I have to hold on to something. But I was worse back then, of course, because I weighed 330 and, and I was in worse shape. So I knew that if I'd go to the gym, I'd be able to find something that I'd, I'd be able to start doing. I wasn't able to like lift, start lifting weights because I can't lift anything much beyond, let's say like, you know, 10 or 15 pounds as an example. So I went to the gym and I saw a recumbent bike. So I figured I'm going to start that. So that's how I got started. And I started writing it down every day in my journal, how many minutes I did and the intensity, how many calories and stuff like that, the heart rate off of my polar heart rate monitor. And I kept going every day. I'd go seven days a week. Every day I was at the gym. And I just kept going and building up slowly. Every every day I'd build it up like a minute or so, you know? I just kept going. Yeah, you that's know, really I, I, interesting. I, I think I think yeah. it's you know, sometimes I'll go to the gym and I, I'll see people there and my thought is like you know, it looks like they're there because they were told to go there to do a specific thing and they don't actually wanna be there. But it sounds like you very much self started. It didn't sound like you had a like a professional or someone come into your life and say Hey, here's the blueprint of tracking macros. Here's the blueprint of increasing exercise. Here's calorie reduction. Here's your basal metal. It sounds like you kind of said, I got to figure this out myself and then motivated yourself and found the tools that you needed to kind of start that success. That's how that, that got started. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Let me just, let me just put another comment on there because I think it's an important thing because you know, you at that point you'd already had, you know, multi-level spinal fusions. I mean, uh, you know, there, that limits you significantly, as you're well aware. And, and the fact that you, despite that, despite yeah. you know, all these sort of things, you were still able to find some type of exercise. And I'm a huge yeah. fan of the, of, the, of, the, of the stationary bikes, you know, particularly, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff on like an Airdyne style bike. But I mean, to me, that's very encouraging for those people that may think I can't do it because, you know, we had, we had, uh, um, Rob Jones on here, you know, on, on the podcast a while ago. And this is a guy who has no legs. I mean, he literally yeah. has above, above knee amputations, both legs, and he's out there running 
marathons and riding his bike across the country. So, I mean, these things are really inspiring for those people out there that are listening or saying, you know, I can't do anything because whatever reason, you know, I, I think right. this is so important to highlight that you can do that there, even if it's, you know, getting on there and doing an arm bike. I mean, they make arm bikes. I mean, there, there are ways you can get, you can improve your fitness. You can almost do anything. You know, so, so that's great. So go ahead. So now mm -hmm. you know, you've, got, you've lost all this weight. You now get diagnosed with this crazy disease. That, you know, you probably never heard of before. And you freaked out about it. And, 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 you know, it's 2011. So tell me what happens next. Okay. I get diagnosed with uh, autoimmune liver disease. Uh, it's like the very first, it's the first part of November of 2011. You know, the first, I'm not, I don't remember the exact date, but it's the beginning of the month. So anyway, that really kind of caught me off guard, you know. In November of 2011, I'm, uh, I was born in 1960, so uh, 51 years old. So you're my uh, age. <laughs> yeah, so I started thinking to myself, you know, okay, there's an autoimmune liver disease. Uh, she told me that folks that get diagnosed with this live on average eight to 10 years, then they end up, end up needing, a, needing a liver transplant. She tells me that I was caught early. There's no cirrhosis of the liver, no scarring of, of liver tissue. The bile ducts were not inflamed at that point. So I started researching on the computer, autoimmune liver disease. Uh, no, excuse me. I would punch in stuff in the search bar like autoimmune disease. And that led me to certain websites. One thing led me to another thing. I started uh, learning about insulin and leptin. Then that led me to uh, Mark's Daily Apple, Mark Sisson's website. I started reading about burning fat or burning sugar. And I started looking into all this stuff. And I was diabetic also. So then, you know, I kept researching and I, I hit Volvic's work. Volokh and Finney's work and uh, Dr. Mikey's, but I started reading all these books and kept on researching. And, but I was still, you know, I did a lot of researching. I learned a lot, but I was still afraid because my father had his first heart attack before he was 30. He had quadruple bypass at the age of 55. My father was terrified of cholesterol and saturated fat. Then, you know, Keyes started running his mouth about that time in 1960 when I was born. So my father, I mean, he was terrified of saturated fat, red meat, and he drilled that into us, you know, and I was always terrified of that stuff. So I had a hard time, you know, learning all this, like making sense of it. And I'm the type of a guy that has to know the exact mechanisms of everything, how it works in my mind, step by step. Uh, like I said, I used to, you know, draw blueprints and uh, I was a metal fabricator. I was a metal machinist. We used to build stuff. I'd read stuff off of blueprints. The way that my mind works, I had to know everything in detail step by step. And I researched this stuff for almost a full year. Uh, I became, you know, like I said, I read all of, at that time I read, I started, uh, Bullock and Finney had the art and science of low carb living. They came out with low carb performance. Uh, I read Dr. Diabe uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution, uh, Dr. Mikey's Protein Power. Uh, I read uh, many, many different blogs, many, many different blogs. You know, I, I learned things from each individual person. I put it all together to fit me. And then finally, I told my wife, you know, after researching in depth and learning about all this stuff, these low-carb diets, ketogenic diets, uh, I told her I'm starting this on November 1st, 2012. And she thought I was crazy because of the saturated fat and higher red meat. And so I said, I'm giving it a shot. I have nothing to lose. Nothing I'm doing now is helping me. I've lost all my weight. I'm a bag of bones. People think I have cancer when they see me. I have, you know, uh, so I have, they tell me I'm going to need a liver transplant down the road anyway. So. I've got nothing to lose, I'm giving this a go, which I did. Uh, and then it took about uh, 18 to 24 months on this, you know, 
I'm going to say, yeah, 18 to 24 months for my liver enzymes, GGT, ALT, AST, and total bilirubin to start coming down to the normal ranges. How, Jeff, just, just, Jeff, just interrupt. How high were the, how high were those levels relative to normal? You know, yeah. just to put in perspective so we know. Yeah, yeah. GGT, ALT, and AST were all in the 200 units per liter range. The normal range for those on the lab reference is like 5 to 50, but a truly normal range for those enzymes is like 5 to 25. So GGT, ALT, and AST were all around 200 to 210. My total bilirubin when I was first diagnosed was almost at 3.0. Uh, and a uh, normal total bilirubin is 0 0.2 to 1.0. So it took about 24 months, and these liver enzymes that I just spoke of and the bilirubin started to come down to almost normal ranges, truly normal. Now, I haven't gone yet this year, but my blood work from last fall, my G GGT came back at... at uh, 12, I believe, units per liter, which is fantastic. My ALT and my AST came back around 18 or 20. And my total bilirubin for the first, first time came down below 1.7. It came down to, came down to 1.2. I haven't gone. I, I used to have to go every six months at first for my blood, blood labs. But the last couple of years, I only go once every 12 months now. So now I have... You know, as of now, I have total normal liver enzymes, normal 1.2 total bilirubin, which is on the higher end of normal. And my blood sugars are, my A1C is running 4.8 to 4.9 percent. I've got normal glycemia. Uh, I'm eating a meat-based diet. I'm not eating four to five pounds of meat per day. I'm not a very active person. I'm 6'2". I weigh... 200 pounds today. I've weighed 200 pounds now for about, I started at no, 11, let's say 12. About the last five years, I've maintained the same weight, which I've never done that in my life. And I'm attributing that, that this low carb diet, now my, I've, got, I've got normal blood sugars, my hunger's well controlled, proper signaling between the, you know, the appetite control centers in the brain. Uh, I can go all day without eating. It doesn't bother me. You know, before, prior to, to these low-carb diets, I'd have to eat every couple of hours, you know. Uh, I was hungry all the time. And this is the first time in my life, the last five years, where I can tell you I don't have to eat every two hours. I can eat once a day if I want to. I can even go longer. It won't bother me. And I wake up early every morning i drink water and i just drink black. the only thing that i drink is water and black coffee i'll have green tea or black tea once in a while i get up in the morning i drink water and black coffee i get in my car and i drive down to the gym and i do my workout on the bike fasted i do that every day seven days a week i do a little bit of light resistance training now uh just uh, not with free weights, but I, I use those uh, resistance machines, nothing heavy, just light. One day I do upper body. I got four or five light exercises. The next day I do lower body. But it's hard for me to gain back lean mass because when I do, like, a, if I do hit on the bike, because of my surgeries in my back, I can't put enough, quite enough torque into it because those titanium rods hold me back from truly putting full torque to give it a true hit, 100%, you know, full. That, and if I try to do it, I have a, a, the rod on the right side of my back from my last surgery pops out of place. And I'm screwed for a couple of weeks so I can't do anything. It's extremely painful, so I have to be careful. But that's where I'm at today. I still have to... I, I still can't lay down in a bed to sleep. I still have to sleep in a lazy boy chair. And sleep, uh, sitting in a normal chair, I can't stay sitting in one place for too long. I got to get up and move. 
I can walk short distances in my house without a cane. I can't walk that fast, but I can walk faster and better than I did in 2005. You know, I can walk better and a little bit faster. My goal has always been one day to throw the cane away and be able to just walk freely without a cane. That's always been my goal, my goal all along. It hasn't happened yet. I'm still trying to, to be able to achieve that. Well, good on you for trying. I mean, that, I mean that, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, so let me just sort of, because, you know, you've had this improvement in your diabetes. Obviously, now you're, you're well within all ranges on your, you know, your hemoglobin A1C, you know, presumably your blood glucose, your, you know, your fasting numbers. You've got, you know, liver enzymes, which are pristine at this point. Now, you're, you're, you're pro I mean, you know, what does the, I mean, are you seeing a hepatologist or a GI doctor? Or I don't know who's managing, who, who typically manages, you know, that, that liver disease. I would assume it would be a hepatologist or at least a GI, you know, guy. But who is, who, what yes, are they saying so. about, what are, what are they saying about this? And, and do they comment on your diet? Do they encourage you on the diet? Do they discourage you on the diet? Do they, do they make any comment on that whatsoever? Well, uh, the first one that diagnosed me, she was, a, she was a lady, and I only had her for like two years, and then she's, she doesn't do that anymore. Now I have a new liver doctor. I told the first doctor, that the lady gastroenterologist, and she didn't, you know, give me advice to do it or not to do it. She just stayed more or less quiet about it. I've never told my newer liver doctor about it i just keep it to myself i mean with a natural history of a disease like primary sclerosis and cholangitis or diabetes in that fact i mean the typical progression is, is, is what they say it progresses it doesn't go away you know based on standard treatment protocols what are they saying the fact that you now have normal liver enzymes has anybody just even made a comment on that do they are they not even curious about that well there's another uh liver disease, well, it's not a liver disease, like two to 5% of the population in the U.S. have what's called Gil Gilbert syndrome. Right. In Gilbert syndrome, you have slightly elevated bilirubin, like between, let's say, 1.5 to 2.0. And it's called Gilbert syndrome, and you don't have other liver, uh, elevated liver enzymes. Now, this last liver doctor that I've had the last couple of years here, because I have pristine liver enzymes today, he's made reference to that. You know, he says you were diagnosed with primary sclerosing. Uh, all of the all of the tests show that, and it was confirmed by three different gastroenterologists at that time. But he's made a comment like. Well, maybe it's only Gilbert syndrome. And he says, no, it can't be because of how you had all these elevated liver enzymes and, you know, the MRI of the bile ducts of the liver and the liver biopsy confirmed primary sclerosing. So he's kind of caught in the middle. He doesn't know what to say, you know, when I go and see him for my yearly visit. Yeah, I mean, you've got a biopsy-proven disease. It's pretty hard to dismiss that. I mean, it might yeah. be, but, uh, you know, so, so uh, I mean, you know, I mean, just out of curiosity, it might be fun to say, hey, doc, I've been on this low-carb diet, you know, with a lot of meat, and, and this is what's happened, and, and see what the reaction is. Because I think we need to educate a lot of physicians out there. And, well, and it might, it can might I tell you something? Patients to do it. Yeah, go ahead. This liver doctor that's, that I have, we, uh, believe it or not, this is going to be hard for you to believe. He has non-alcoholic fatty liver. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, a lot of people have it now. I mean, it's, it's so damn common. But uh, yeah. so he, he, and, and he probably, you know, we we're seeing people reverse that, that condition as well, you know, using, yes. using low-carbohydrate diets. And so it's, it's, I mean, I would imagine if he was aware of that, then he might have tried that himself maybe. You know, that's why I, I mean, I came to this whole low carb, you know, keto carnivore thing by the fact that I was having health issues and, and I had enough interest to take care of myself to, to kind of make this journey. But uh, so it might be interesting just the next time you go in and talk to him and say, hey, doc, you know, 
this is what I've done since 2011 or 2012, and this is what seems to have helped me. I think the more people to get out there and tell their stories, it's going to change some more people's mind. It may not change his mind. Maybe it won't. I mean, this podcast may. There may be some docs listening on this podcast and hear the story. But that's that's really interesting. So let me uh, – um, let me just dig more into so your diet. You said I couldn't understand. Did you say you ate four to five pounds of red meat today, or were you just referring? Uh, to me? No, no, no. I said I I don't do like Dr. Okay. Sean Baker. <laughs> okay, I, gotcha. I can't eat four to five pounds meat. Uh, four to five pounds of meat per day. I'm not, you know, I'm fairly sedentary. I I'm sitting down in a in a, in a lazy boy chair for more, a, a good portion of the 24 hour period. Or sleeping in a chair. Uh, I'm six two. I weigh two hundred pounds. Like I said, I don't have that much lean mass. I'm trying to build on it, but it, it's hard. Uh, I probably eat on average uh, one and a half to two pounds of meat per day. I, you know, and I also eat some low, uh, low carb fib- fibrous vegetables. Not a lot. I do eat some. Yeah, I mean, I mean. I mean- I, I primarily eat one meal per day in the evening. Yeah, I mean, and that, I mean, one and a half to two pounds of meat a day is, is a hell of a lot of meat for the average person. On the carnivore community, which I'm part of, that's pretty typical. That's, that's a pretty typical amount. But I mean, and I, and I tend to be an outlier because I'm just bigger than most people. But that, that's very interesting, you know, that you're eating all that meat. Your diabetes is, is very well controlled. If not, some people would say cured or at least in remission. Uh, you've got this autoimmune disease that appears to be completely not active right now. And, and again, eating all this meat, goodness gracious. So let's talk about your cholesterol because you probably have those numbers. What, what's going on with the cholesterol? Because a lot of people would be interested in about that. Uh, you know, there's it's very controversial now uh, about what the role of cholesterol is in in, in disease. So let, let's let's do you have that information? Well, yes. Uh, my. Uh labs prior to a, to a low carbohydrate diet. My HDL cholesterol was 29. I had fasting triglycerides of 250. LDL of about between 65 to 70. I've always had low, low LDL cholesterol. Uh, now my labs come back. My HDL always runs between 87 to 105. My fasting trigs always run between 30 and 40. My LDL, it always stays the same, 65 to 70. Don't ask me why, I have no idea for the LDL. Yeah, I mean, that that's, again, I mean, I'm certainly the HDL and the triglyceride, that's pretty typical. We see that very commonly in a, in a low carbohydrate diet. You know, in many people, there, there's at least several good studies that indicate that those are potential risk factors for cardiovascular disease and so that's a favorable profile obviously even the even the people that are on the uh, you know from any any dietary aspect would say that that low ldl is not a problem for for heart disease and even if it was high it may or may not be given your situation but that's that's it's very interesting to see what i've seen in this low carb community is that the ldl response tends to be variable you know, and, and one of the things we often run into is a lot of people want to check their labs, you know, a month or two into their diet. And is we've had, you know, Dave Feldman on there and others that talk about the dynamic nature of cholesterol. And a lot of times, you know, we just see these transient elevations um, during a weight loss period, during a rapid weight loss period. And so it's, you know, a lot of people say just wait, you know, wait, wait six months or a year until your weight is stabilized even before you mess with this stuff, just so you don't have that con- confounder of, weight loss and shifting weight and, 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 and perturbations of the energy system causing uh, shifts in the LDL. Now, for my, my own personal situation, going from a standard omnivorous, relatively high-carb diet to a fully carnivorous diet, my LDL didn't change much at all. I mean, it's always, for me, been a little bit on the high side at about 130, 140. Uh, my triglycerides went down dramatically, and my HDL improved, you know, about 25%. So, I mean, uh, I, I'm kind of similar to you. I mean, you had a significant bump in your in your HDL, which is pretty pretty interesting. Um, you know, so that's interesting stuff. You know, I, I think there's there's so much more we got to learn on this stuff. Learn what what how contextually how these things uh, fall into play. So what so what's been going on lately with you? Uh, 
what's new for you, Jeff, as far as, you know, you're trying to just, is there any thought to maybe trying to do some work now at this point? Are you still, because you're, you know, I mean, online work or, you know, some kind of something like that. Well, I, I, I write posts often on my Facebook page. I'm pretty deep into researching type two diabetes and liver diseases, fatty liver. I'm a person that researches fairly deep, fairly deep, you know, into that stuff. And I, I used to write posts very often on my Facebook. I don't write as often now, but I do try and share information as much as I can. I have a lot of people that message me, you know, for 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 information on with a low carb diet and type two diabetes and fatty liver disease. And I have people that message me, and I try and help them as best I can. Um, I've you know. I've come to realize that I'm never going to be able to go to, you know, I'm never going to be able to go back to the work physically, you know, you know, have a job. I mean, I, it, that's just the way it is. I've finally come to uh, grips with that. I had a hard time dealing with that, but I finally come to accept that fact, you know? So that, uh, I continue learning as much as I can on a daily basis and, I try to help people as best I can. Hey, Jeff, I noticed um, just to kind of like add to what you just said, I think um, I, I, I think I remember this right, that you had uh, when you kind of first started following a low carb diet, you did a, kind of more of a what would be considered like a strict clinical ketogenic diet where you kind of regulated yep. not just carbs, but also protein, but more recently have kind of relaxed your efforts of keeping the protein low. Um, is that true? And if so, like, have you noticed what what differences have you noticed, if anything? Uh, yes, what you said is true. When I first started, it was lower protein, uh, but I've been eating this way now for probably uh, time goes by so fast. So in twenty eighteen, <laughs> uh, for a couple of years anyway, I'd say twenty six. Let's say late twenty fifteen. Late 2015 until now, I've been eating this way. More protein than I used to eat. Uh, I've noticed that I had, I don't know, I just, for me, I just seem to feel better. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a high-end, you know, I'm not a, a person that does all this physical, heavy physical exercise. I do go to the gym every day and I have a, I ride on the bike a certain amount every day and I, do light resistance training but i've also noticed too that i can eat one meal a day and i stay satisfied until the next meal the following day you know which is like a 24-hour period is that it seems is that, to make that, it seems to make that easier for me the increased protein does or just the ketogenic yes. okay cool uh, yeah compared to before compared to lower protein mm-hmm When's the last time you saw a dietitian, Jeff? I mean, is that, you know? Uh, well, I go to my primary care doctor <coughs> once, once a year. I've had the same primary care doctor. She, she's the one that, that caught my elevated liver enzymes. Uh, she's a vegan herself. And she knows that I follow a low-carb keto-style diet. She doesn't recommend it to people, but... She listens to my advice, believe it or not. She questions me. She believes what I'm telling her. She sees all of my blood work and my, my, you know, my triglycerides, my blood sugars, my A1Cs. She sees that I'm doing fantastic without any diabetes medications. She sees what it's doing for my liver disease. She thinks it's super fantastic. Well, that's good to hear that, you know, despite kind of following as a, a pretty drastically different approach that she's, you know, looking at, you know, your health markers improving and, you know, applauding you for that. And, you know, I think that's, that's pretty cool. And I think, you know, stories like that are good because we definitely see a lot of the, you know, stories get promoted that would speak to the opposite of that sort of a, an approach. So I'm glad you were able to have a positive experience. Yeah. Very positive. Well, Jeff, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, uh, 
Tony Martinez is a fellow that kind of got us in contact with you. You know, Tony is a he's a lawyer. That I guess he's based. I think he's in the New York area. Spends a lot of time in D.C. He's involved with a lot of the politics and has been around. You know, been uh, in the past involved with some of the health policy, dietary policy stuff in politics. I'm not sure exactly how he does. I know he knew Doctor Doctor Robert Atkins. Uh, so he's a very big proponent. He was a big fan of yours, and he 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 reached out. I'm glad he did. I think this has been helpful. I think it's it's nice to get the common person's perspective because we do talk. You know, we talk to a lot of scientists and physicians, and you know, it's 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 always nice to get the patient's perspective on this stuff. And I think a lot of people can relate to this, and I think this is something that's going to impact a lot of people that are listening to it. You know, it's 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 very accessible. You know, it doesn't have to be overly technical or we sometimes we get into the weeds on the you know the technical issues and a lot of people just they don't have a, they don't have a, a background in it. And so it's really good to have a real person on here telling a real story. And it's a very common story as far as the, the situation you were in. It's it's uncommon that you got out of that. I mean the more common situation is you know, you get so sick and it just continues to spiral out and then you spend the rest of your life in misery and die early, which I'm so glad that has not happened to you, and hopefully the people that are sitting there that may be in somewhat of a similar situation will take heart and consider, um, just consider stepping outside the box a little bit and, uh, you know, you know, doing what, what it takes to get better. Because, you know, I think most intelligent and, and compassionate positions will support that, even if it doesn't necessarily match their personal beliefs, or even even if it doesn't match necessarily what what some of the some of the research tells them. I mean, we got to go with results ultimately. Yes, yes. Uh, Tony Martinez is the one that shared that post that I wrote a while back. Broken man. Tony's the one that that shared it with you. That's how you you found out about me and asked me on the podcast. And Jeff, is that right. is that post somewhere specific so that we can link that to the show notes too? So if our listeners want, they can go and read it. Uh, Broken Man, it's on my Facebook page. Uh, I can send you a link via email direct from my Facebook, but I'm not sure if they'll be able to link to it. Yeah, I mean, I can just link to your, your Facebook <laughs> too, and then they can head over there and, and find it if they want to read it too. So I think, uh, yeah. you know, I think your story is great, and I think it shows like, that it shows the power of just taking control of your fitness. And like, I know, like Sean was saying, things can get very complicated and you can certainly make things complicated when you really get into the weeds with a lot of the stuff and nutrition and things. But, you know, you know, ultimately I think there is a lot that can be done by just a person deciding like you that, you know, it's time to kind of make some changes and it's time to, you know, look to what's, what's, what's working for, for other people and, and kind of mapping your own journey. Yes, exactly. Exactly right. Well, Jeff, you've inspired me to go to the gym and work out extra hard today. Man. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I've, got, I've got to come back and do another podcast later today. So, I'll, you know, yeah. we, we should probably just uh, uh, shut it down now. I think we've got some great information out here. I, I'm sure our listeners are going to be thrilled to listen to this one. I, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm, Jack and I are going to be thrilled to put this out there. But uh, again, so Jeff Sear, it's CYR. Is, is CYR, yeah. CYR is the name, and uh, uh, you know that's a, there's a there's a there, I think it was a famous strength athlete called Lewis Sear back in the uh, early 1900s, late 1800s. It was a famous uh, uh, strong man. So look him up sometime. Maybe you're related. Who knows? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for thanks for inviting me for inviting me on the podcast. Thanks, guys. Absolutely, our pleasure, Jeff. Have a good rest of the day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.